After Stalin's death, Hungary had remained under the ruthless dictatorship of Matyas Rakosi. Like Stalin, Rakosi killed and imprisoned his rivals, but people were expected to cheer and conform. The new Kremlin leadership disapproved of Rakosi. A senior Soviet official was sent to deal with him. Mikoyan, the Armenian wheeler dealer, arrived. Rakosi and I went to meet him at the airport and took him back by car. We were almost at the guest house when Mikoyan turned to Rakosi and said, the Soviet leadership has decided you are ill. Well, Rakosi didn't think he was ill. But of course in those days, illness was a political decision. Mikoyan continued, you will need treatment in Moscow, so you will have to resign. The Soviets allowed Andras Hegedus to remain Prime Minister. But reformers in the Hungarian Communist Party sought a leader more independent from Moscow. They wanted Imre Naj to take over. Like Gomulka in Poland, Naj was seen as a leader who would reform the party. Inspired by Gomulka's success in Poland, Thousands poured into the streets of Budapest. Students and workers demanded free speech, the disbanding of the secret police and the withdrawal of Soviet troops. They paraded Hungarian flags with the communist emblem torn out. The demonstrators carried portraits of Imre Naj. Communist reformers urged him to take charge. Imre Naj was suddenly taken from his home uh, to the parliament and uh, he had uh, spoke of some minutes. He began uh, saying comrades and then the crowd roared and said we are not comrades. Naj had misjudged the popular mood. Hungarians wanted immediate and radical change. In the center of Budapest, an excited crowd toppled the monument to Stalin. Naj stayed silent when Hungary's tottering communist leadership called on the Kremlin to crush the growing unrest. Armed civilians had prevented Soviet tank reinforcements from entering Budapest. The Hungarians had equipped themselves with Molotov cocktails, rifles, machine guns and enthusiasm. I don't know how the guns work, but uh, one older man, his name was Pistobachi, he says, don't worry about it, I'm going to teach you. And then I looked at the gun was bigger than me. He explained to me and showed me a couple of times. And the very first time I had to use it, I closed my eyes because, you know, for scared. I never used gun before. So then... Uh, and I looked around and there was a couple of soldiers there and they teared up the, from the uniform. They had the uh, stars for the Russian stars, so they teared it off. And they said, don't worry about little girl, we take care of you. During four days of fighting, the Budapest revolutionaries stood their ground. There were heavy losses on both sides. Imre Naj arranged a ceasefire. The Soviets agreed to withdraw their troops from Budapest. The Kremlin hoped Naj, now Prime Minister, could restore communist authority. But the patriot in Naj was taking over. Cautiously, he decided to back the Hungarian revolutionaries. During the fighting in Budapest, many people had taken refuge in cellars. As they emerged, they found much of their city in ruins. The Hungarians thought they had won their revolution. They came out to mourn their dead heroes.
Western correspondents flocked to Hungary to report on a victory. What do you hope will happen now? Uh, we hope uh, that our country will be entirely free and we can uh, work and we can have free connections with West. Uh, uh, newspapers. People were enormously optimistic that life had changed. Everywhere in the country, the Hungarian tricolor was flying with the middle torn out, the communist emblem torn out. It was, seemed to be, a completely liberated country. With the Soviet army no longer in the city, the revolutionaries in Budapest took revenge. Communist party offices were destroyed. The red flag burned. Secret policemen were strung up. Other communist states, especially China, were urging Khrushchev to use force. It was very complicated decision to my father. As he told, for three or four days, he talked with the Chinese, with other representatives, and one time they decided not to use force, then they told, no, we have to use force, yes, no, yes, no. At last it was decision, yes, to use it. On November the 4th, 1956, the Soviet army re-entered Budapest. Khrushchev had ordered the attack after the Americans had let him understand that as far as Eisenhower was concerned, Hungary belonged in the Soviet sphere of influence. Too late, Imre Naj appealed to the world. The Hungarian fighters waited in vain for Western help. And the fact that if the West intervened, it ran the high risk of it generating a world war, uh, really meant that uh, we didn't want to see uh, physical uprisings. And, we d and the, the policy, at least, was don't, also don't create any hopes on the part of the, so of the uh, satellite countries that we will intervene. Radio Free Europe, when they were saying, hang on to three weeks, three more weeks, we come in, we help you. So we fight for the less bullet, the less drop of blood we was holding on to. And what happened was, they was lying to us. Nobody came. The Hungarian revolution was crushed. Thousands were killed in the fighting. Imre Naj was executed. Two hundred thousand Hungarians fled into Austria before the frontier was sealed by Soviet troops. The millions who stayed behind in Hungary were prisoners. Khrushchev had reinforced the Iron Curtain. <laughs> 